Olly, Andrea, it's a pleasure to have you here um, as a guest in the final lecture of, of th this round, at least, of the Digital Urban Culture Lecture Series. Um, so this series, just to give you a little bit of context, was set up to uh, give our colleagues the chance to invite um, people that they feel are inspiring and important for, for their work and that they wanted to share with, with us, basically. It's a gift from each other <laughs> um, in the team for each other. So it's very, very, very nice that we have you here. And um, with that, I hand over to Sophie because she's the one who invited um, you here today. Looking very, very forward to your input. Great, thank you, Hilke. There are still colleagues entering the call. Um, so first of all, um, Leandri, welcome. Welcome to our last lecture from the Digital Urban Culture Lecture Series. And um, I have the pleasure to quickly introduce you and then I hand over to you for your lecture. Um, Leandri is currently doing his PhD um, at the UNESCO Chair of Urban Landscape at the University of Montreal and focusing in his research on AI and governance. Um, you have all your, your career as an urban planner. Um, you had different roles in city planning, city development, and it's all underscored by your passion of integrating technology into urban planning. Um, you've worked for several years at UN Habitat in Nairobi. So this is also where we met um, first or where we got in contact. You worked there as an urban innovation and digital governance consultants, um, developing different master plans, um, playing a, a crucial role in, in also formulating national um, policy. And um, what's also super, super exciting and interesting for us is that you are the co-founder of the African Innovation Network, um, which is a think tank dedicated to um, issues where you have an um, annually magazine um, called African City Magazine, what you're publishing. Um, where we are also about to publish um, with our colleagues from Unitag. So very happy to, to also hear a little bit more on that. Um, so with your um, think tank, you organize different events, you produce documentaries, video podcasts. Um, you're also an urban photographer. So this is super exciting that you're playing so many different roles and being involved in so many different contexts. But today, um, I think you mainly focus on your on your research, on your current research on AI and governance um, and focusing on well-being of people in cities and um, related to AI and governance. And with this, Leandri, um, very warm welcome. And I hand over to you for your lecture. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sophie, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I hope you are all doing well. And that is not too late uh, for you <laughs> because I'm in Montreal, so it's still uh, in the morning. So I'm still fresh, but I hope I'm not uh, <laughs> like uh, like grabbing or consuming your, your, your afternoon. But anyway, um, I'm also very honored to know that I'm a gift. So please enjoy your gift as much as possible. <laughs> So it's not every day that we got a um, uh, gift. So yeah, thanks again for the invitation. I'm very pleased and honored to be here with you. And it's gonna be a kind of, it's not more like an exchange than a formal lecture. So anytime, do not hesitate to like uh, give inputs or don't agree of, with what I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. So yeah, so I will just, I mean, the way I prepared this is not like, you will see at some point, I made some questions like for you to give input and this kind of thing. So uh, I will just let you know when I will uh, need you. So this presentation is on uh, issue related to AI governance. Uh, it's just to give a global picture on, of uh, AI governance from the international level to the city level and what are the issues or challenges that cities or the way cities are approaching this um, uh, issue of uh, AI governance. So the outline here is um, around those three points. We'll try to answer to those uh, three points. Uh, what is governance, uh, first of all, and why does it matter? And um, I mean, what is the current landscape of uh, AI governance um, at different level? So as I said, um, at some point, I I would have loved to do this presentation in, in person because it would be more interactive with me, more like in a formal way we exchange, with, uh, we interact, but it's not possible. But 
I made, I included the presentation, just for you questions. So that's why I'm using this platform called Ask Like probably some of you may know it. It's like, it's made the presentation more interactive. I know you are probably using your phone or your computer to watch this. So uh, I will probably request an additional, uh, uh, I will probably request um, an additional screen for you, like just to, 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 oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. Then it's fine. So just to, I will show you the QR code here. You can just scan this QR code to join the presentation. You, or you can also decide to, uh, use the link uh, on the screen, ask like, go to the ask and then tap CSL2024. So, um, yeah, as I said, uh, we will try first to answer to the question, what is governance? And um, yeah, going from theory to history, and then uh, before we start, uh, the first question to you, um, I know it's a globe, it's a very broad and large concept, but I want to know from your perspective what um, comes in your mind when you think about governance. Uh, the answer doesn't need to be formal. Like you, you can think about someone specifically, a city, a place, or anything. Like uh, okay, Foucault, yeah, <laughs> a good one, uh, Michel Foucault. Um, uh, yeah. He, he agreed, agreed rules, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Rankier, I don't know this one. Is it an author on the concept? I can see it's a French word, a ministry, yeah, um, related to government, so guidelines, yeah. Um, this can be lead to okay power struggles yeah also a good one territory power dynamics yeah oh leadership oh perfect so yeah oh good so as we can see uh, when we think about governance they are hierarchies yeah slow control yeah they are all those concepts elements related to that that comes um, in our mind and as we will see meeting rooms okay <laughs> uh, this is uh, quite formal um. But, okay, thanks a lot for your inputs. It gives me uh, a, a good perspective. As we will, as we will see throughout the, the presentation, we'll explore some of uh, these aspects. Um, uh, okay, so just um, a very quick history. It's like, um, as we are seeing, governance uh, applies both uh, to the public and the private sector, and it's generally defined as, a, as the act of governing. So the terms uh, um, it comes from the word, the Greek word, sorry for the pronunciation, the Greek verb, uh, meaning to steer a ship. Uh, that's why you see the picture of, um, you probably know the, the, the movie, but anyway. <laughs> and then uh, the word evolved into the Latin governare uh, uh, in the old French governé, uh, leading to the English word governance and then government. So in the 80s and the 90s, so the word was initially used to in construct government. So it this was during a time of uh, neoliberal reforms in the public sector in the West, which typically um, saw a shift from hierarchical bureaucracy to market and horizontal other networks. So uh, and therefore, the governance referred to an approach where the state is less preeminent um, are no longer seen as the supreme entity managing territory, but uh, rather as an actor among uh, among among others. So, um, this is just to give a, just to start uh, giving a definition. Uh, you probably know this uh, author, which is um, Raw Rhodes, which is professor of political science, and he used the concept of governance to refer to the shifting boundary between public, private, and voluntary sector, as well as uh, the changing role of uh, of the state. So he employed the term to explore how informal authority within network complements and sometimes replace the formal authority of uh, government. So Rhodes, um, in 
many of his book and papers examines the limits of the state and seek to develop kind of more diverse view of uh, of state authority and and its uh, and its exercise so um in this this is also a very good resource is the handbook of theory on the theories of governance from Christopher Ansel and Jacob Toffin. And there the term is defined um, as the interactive process through which society and the economy are steered uh, toward collectively uh, negotiated goals. So the aspect of negotiation participation really comes in when we talk about governance in this handbook. So, and several concepts are associated with it, such as public participation, accountability, transparency, and so on and so forth. So, and you have also other interesting concepts um, such as networks, uh, power, deliberation, and and trust as well. So these concepts are linked uh, to different forms uh, like co-production, collaboration, uh, mutual level governance, meta-governance, um, supranational governance, and so on. So these different forms of governance also in, um, evolved in various uh, different contexts. It's crucial to understand here that each form of governance involves specific objectives, actors, mechanism, tools, um, which means that uh, the stake uh, can, it can change, it can vary. So we can govern, for example, through policy, law, so on and so forth. So this is important because depending on the environment, subtle but uh, decisive variation can occur uh, in each context. So or the objectives of a governance mode may not be met or may produce uh, unexpected results. For example, in collaborative governance, which um, with public participation, it's essential to know uh, when, how, and with whom to participate to avoid uh, what we make, what we co often call uh, participatory washing. So um, then uh, what does it matter? I hope I haven't bored you too much with the theories around uh, those uh, the history of governance, but now we will try to look at uh, why, I mean, what why it's important. So, uh, before still again um, another input from you. So I just wanted to know. Let me just show the 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 QR code. Um, okay, it's here. So I wanted to 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 know if you see any importance when it comes to. Uh, I mean, technology in terms of governance, do you think that it's important based on what you know about the concept and based on that history and different theories that are related to this aspect of governance? Do you think, I think most of the people uh, thinks, uh, think that governance um, is important when it comes to technology? So that's good. So it means we kind of have the same perspective. I hope so. Okay, perfect. So then let's um, let's move on. Uh, thanks uh, for the answers. So, <clears throat> um, as you probably know, um, um, technology has always been part of uh, human history. So, if we think about it, even human themselves can be considered as a form of technology. So from the learning to use tool to controlling fire over 1.7 billions uh, millions so years ago the use of technology um constantly transform our way of living and the space we inhabit so the practice for agriculture 10,000 years before Christ enabled humans to settle and develop uh, third cities. And in the cities, uh, increasingly uh, revolutionary technology emerged, uh, one of the most transformative uh, <clears throat> being the, the, the steam engine and the ensuring uh, industrial revolution. So um, distance became sh um, uh, shorter and travel became also easier. So we can see um, that technology has always been part of um, of our life. But uh, what is um, kind of remarkable is the speed at which uh, we progress through different stages of uh, uh, technological development from the discovery of agricultural evolution, like around 1.7 million years past. And from that agricultural evolution to the Bronze Age, it took like 
760, yeah, 60, 700 years, followed by around 21 years um, um, for, to reach the Iron Age. So, uh, but the advancements uh, of the 20th uh, century led to artificial intelligence in just 50 years. So, um, I don't know if you have seen the Netflix series, uh, The Tree Body Problem, but uh, one of the most tricking things in that series for me is like, when they, what they call our Lord, basically the ones coming in the head, like they were, uh, it was um, explaining that why they were sabotaging human technological development. Essentially, it will take them like more than 400 years to reach the earth from their civilization, um, to save their civilization from their dying planet. So given the rapid technological uh, development of humans, they prefer to end their human technological research to avoid human becoming more advanced uh, by the time they will arrive. So for me, it's still a, a, a serial movie, but for me, it's quite a good illustration of, of how fast we are going with this uh, technological development. So, um, as I mentioned, the advancement of um, of the 20th century led to artificial intelligence in just 50 years. Uh, this is an illustration for me, job shows the history of some technological advancement, how uh, they impacted user and society as a, as a whole. So we can see that technology evolved rapidly, especially um, digital technology. But however, how um, as uh, we will see, this is not uh, without... Uh, 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 consequences. So, um, the rap this rapid evolution deeply transformed transforms the way we communicate, exchange information, our relationships with uh, our environments and each other. So, I remember when I was a when I was a child, my family and I um, lived in a small town, and for my parents who grew up in a in a village, uh, the only way to stay in con in, in constant communication with their family was through intermediaries. So of course they were the, the postal um, service, but it was quite expensive uh, at that time. So what did they do? So uh, whenever someone traveled from the village to the town, they collected all the letters they could in a village and once in town, they would go around distributing them to the, to the family. Sometimes uh, they even made the journey on food. So this is what, a, a form of frugality with postal services that uh, were not accessible uh, to everyone. Then um, the mobile phone arrived, um, making it easier to exchange information between families. We also saw the emergence of new type of service and profession, called as my country, Cameroon, uh, what they call call boxes. Um, it's kind of local services where people can get airtime, make, call, make calls. Uh, you can see it uh, almost in many um, cities in Africa, like in, I saw it in Nairobi, uh, in Tanzania, and so on. So <clears throat> it was, again, another form of frugality. And along the same line, we saw the rapid ways of uh, mobile banking services. And another revolution uh, was the advent of the internet. I wasn't like bored when it started, but I remember as a teenager, we often went to what we call cyber cafes. We would meet friends uh, there to do research for our homework and so on. And interestingly, <laughs> some teacher like at that time was thinking that using Google for homework or even typing our assignments uh, they were against that. So for them, it should be they had to be handwriting and go to library and collect information and so on. Just this just me reminds the the, the current debate about AI in education, but that's another topic. So, and um, yeah, in this uh, basically cyber cafes, we were socializing, playing online game, and and so on. And despite the this technological revolution, at least from my experience at the time. Accessing digital services and information often required physically going to specific uh, places that were uh, an integral part of uh, urban life. So at call boxes, people would, would meet, gossip, and these places were also located at the street intersection uh, with street food vendors, motor taxis, and other local services nearby. So it was um, the same as well for cyber cafes. Everyone knew um, um, 
the neighborhood the neighborhood cyber cafe was located who was in charge of that and and so on but today is a completely different story uh, access to information and uh, and um, and um, and services is our is uh, at our um, at our fing fingerprints. So this urban materiality linked to digital technology is no longer visible or has changed uh, its form. So uh, whether it's accessing housing, mobility information, everything is done by uh, through a, a smartphone. And we now talking about um, a city as a platform of uh, of um, of platform. So and in this fully digital cities. Uh, Michael Batty, um, in his recent book, uh, talk about uh, computable cities, where technologies are used not only to understand, but also to control the city. And from this perspective, uh, I I prefer this term over the smart city one, uh, which, as you know, is quite uh, controversial. But essentially, technology um, is omnipresent in the city uh, at uh, all levels. So in urban design, urban analysis, urban management, technology are increasingly uh, 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 embedded in, 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 in our urban system. But indeed, this technology, uh, digital technology is becoming um, uh, more important in cities. Um, and also the COVID-19 has shown that uh, it's also essential uh, uh, it plays an essential role uh, in service delivery, data, sensor, digital um, interface, artificial intelligence. They are all transforming mobility, access to housing, waste management, citizen participation and service delivery in many cities and territory um, thanks to, 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 to algorithm. So, but this technology, I mean, um, they enable efficient, efficient gain, quicker service delivery, as I said, and optimize urban management. But the story, um, <laughs> uh, if the story were perfect, we wouldn't be here discussing it, right? So, emerging technologies, as we are, uh, as we may know, uh, do enhance um, efficiency to service pollution, but they create a near technological determinism where everything revolves around data issue like uh, digital divide, digital right inequality, and the exclusion of um, vulnerable group become more um, ac um, acute in cities where digital technologies is um, increasingly um, prevalent. So the growing, this growing role of, role of uh, technology in city generate new social problems, deep and existing inequality, create um, new ones and benefit the wealth, um, the wealthy while punishing the poor. So exclusion and inequality in the digital age, um, I mean, we can see it uh, through different forms uh, uh, depending on the on the context. For example, digital profiling using algorithm based on individual uh, localization, uh, locations, social networks, or online content consumption. This can lead to like uh, discriminatory, uh, discriminatory or biased decision in employment, housing, or social services. You. You have probably heard about the the Dutch Taike benefit scandal in the in the Netherlands, just as an, an illustration. So, making decision based on algorithm generated uh, outcome in social um, interaction, like in cities, uh, can generate um, can lead to biased judgments. Uh, for instance, uh, are not uh, um, regularly traveling through, for example, crime prone area, like someone who is traveling to crime prone area uh, to get to work or being part of uh, the same religious group or Facebook group or someone involved in crimes, that doesn't, uh, does not make someone a criminal, right? So algorithm based on such information will lead to bias and discriminatory choices. Um, fortunately, um, I mean, this kind of profiling is, um, is prohibited in most uh, AI policy, including the, the recent EU AI Act. So in the digital urban landscape, so uh, we can see that citizens are increasingly seen as a source of data production, transforming into world and through domination through like flex flexible influence or on individual behaviors and decision in a increasingly aggressive uh, consumer society, right? So 
citizens in this ecosystem, I mean, they are shaped um, and standardized by feeling uh, the new norm of uh, the, of this uh, basically digital city. So, and we can also see that deployment of um, strategy and policy for technology in urban area can then serve or produce pattern of social exclusion and special inequality. So, for example, investigating in downtown um, attractiveness and profiling disadvantages uh, peripheral neighborhoods is a kind of also reproduction of existing social and spatial inequality. I mean, all what I'm saying, this doesn't does not uh, negate uh, a significant potential of technology or the positive change it could bring. But however, it can also be a vector of inequality when data is used to categorize like individuals or guide uh, urban policy to benefit some some rather than addressing the real needs needs and uh, when I when I say real um <clears throat> real needs I'm talking about uh, uh, those of uh, citizens. So another illustration uh, is the a digital service platform like uh, Uber or Airbnb that has reshaped service delivery in many cities uh, worldwide, but I also I like the uh, exclusionary power of uh, those new technology over the most uh, vulnerable, concentrating uh, this power in the hands of uh, uh, what we call what I call digital giants. So, for example, in Casablanca, <clears throat> Morocco, uh, for instance. Uh, um, Uber withdraw in 2017, yeah. Following, I mean, some strong protests from taxi drivers or the livelihood threatened by this giant. And it was the same also in Cameroon in 2023, following protests from, from taxi drivers. So we can see that in this example that the pattern of exclusion uh, of, uh, of sensitive groom is evident. Uh, which are the taxi drivers on whom family depends, uh, and they are part of what, what <clears throat> I found marginalized, marginalized group by this digital giant increasingly um, expanding in the cities. So um, then moreover, due to the social groups, um, uh, they find it challenging to engage in different activities. So when you are a taxi, sometimes it's the only activity that you can that you can do. So if we move on, that's what uh, um, Katie O'Neill, uh, one also a very good author, calls uh, weapon of mass uh, destruction in her book. So this is the digital system that, due to the opacity, the scale of the impact and the damage and the damage it caused, uh, like basically punish and oppress um, the weakest, trapping them into a kind of feedback loop um, that uh, condemns them in roles assigned by algorithms. So uh, what we have just discussed become like even more significant uh, with the advent of uh, artificial intelligence. So this is why governance is important, not just governance, but uh, mostly good governance. So a holistic governance that relies on ethical, moral, and social principles to ensure the well-being of uh, citizens. So for example, you and Abita talks about uh, people-centered smart cities. We won't debate the terminology here, but it's about understanding that the core idea is uh, the well-being of, um, of, uh, of people. So um, then let's look at the global landscape of um, of AI uh, 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 governance. And I mean, um, like when we speak about that, uh, I mean, there are several levels at play when we talk about AI governance. First, at the international level, like you can see institution, like international institution establishing recommendation norms and standards, for example, they are the AI principle developed by OECD in 2019 and the UNESCO recommendation on, on the ethic of AI in 2021. We will not go through all of them. There are many of them, but um, I want to emphasize on two, uh, which I found quite interesting, is the at the United Nations level, uh, the General Assembly adopted uh, a, a resolution, uh, I think, yeah, last on March, yeah, 11, something like that. So. They 
And this resolution emphasizes the international uh, cooperation and, solid and solidarity among uh, states in AI deployment. So it calls on more um, advanced country to support less advanced one in uh, development and encourage uh, like a kind of international cooperation. Of course, the text calls also uh, for adherence to ethical principle, responsibility, transparency, and uh, and explainability, and so on and so forth. So, but overall, um, even in the as we can see, even at the international level, the potential of AI is clearly recognized, and its advance is kind of promoted and assumed. Uh, we are far, very far from the skepticism of some times ago where some believe that AI deployment should be slowed down. So we are very far away from that. So, but however, regulation here remains really important. And this is where the second tool that I want to share, wanted to share with you, the EU AI Act comes in a unique instrument as it's the first of this kind to regulate um, on AI at the international level. So it prohibits certain application. You probably know um, the, that tool, it, um, Maybe certain AI application that threaten citizen rights, such as biometric categorization, system based on sensitive characteristics, and the indiscriminate uh, retrieval um, of facial image and the internet of, and from the internet or surveillance uh, footage to create like uh, databases, facial recognition databases. So, emotion recognition is also prohibited. And um, but what I've seen is like. There are some exceptions related to law enforcement when it comes to this kind of specific AI. And there's also clear obligation um, of set for high risk AI systems. Example, like uh, of AI, high risk use um, uh, include um, uh, critical infrastructure, education, uh, vocational training, um, employment, uh, essential public uh, and private as well services and certain law enforcement system, migration border management, justice and democratic. So such system, such AI uh, Irish system um, must assess and mitigate risk, keep usage log, be transparent and create and ensure human oversight. So um, citizen, we have also the right to feel, complain about AI system and receive explanation for decision based on AI risk, AI system that affect their, their rights. So, uh, but the thing is, why this all this instrument regulates AI um, development and deployment, like uh, such so kind of concrete mechanism are still needed to articulate and translate this global uh, regulation into national and and local agendas and and programs so at the the next level is the national level so i will not uh, spend too much time on that but at the national level government formulate like kind of comprehensive strategies that align their vision for for integrating ai into social and economic development and this strategy like basically aim to increase investment in ai research and development promote business uh, innovation um through uh, for example support measures such as financial and incentives and uh, foster a robust uh, digital infrastructure. But uh, what is interesting is like, according to the 2024 Responsible AI Index report, um, why there are many examples of um, approaches to AI governance, uh, the existence of framework doesn't like necessarily mean that uh, responsible AI is being promoted and advanced at the national level. So in most country that they have studied, so the national, for example, the national AI strategy constitute the primary, if not the only national uh, governmental framework for, for AI. So uh, AI governance like basically remains more of a, of a concept that a concrete, um, that a concrete approach. I hope, uh, I'm, well, okay, you are still there because I'm not seeing you, so. <laughs> Okay, just checking, like, maybe I'm speaking to myself since. <laughs> since yes, we are still there. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, okay, thank you. So um, uh, I hope I'm not too boring. Don't, do not hesitate to, like, if you want to tell something or even laugh or, I don't know, 
it's always <laughs> good to hear from from the audience every time so perfect so um then uh, let's move on so uh we get to the city level so i mean um Basically, how cities approach this uh, AI AI governance. So it's uh, in this like kind of as you are seeing challenging articulation between the international and national governance uh, and the also the lack of concrete action on, of uh, for responsible AI cities kind of find themselves without clear guidance, right? So, but what's interesting like municipality uh, as a private entity uh, responsible for urban management. They play a central role in AI governance. So due to the lack of synergy and coordination between different level of AI governance, um, those cities like kind of regulatory, financial, technical, and institutional framework necessary to ensure that uh, uh, responsible to ensure responsible AI development in their territories. So despite these challenges, we can see some of the major cities developing their own approaches for responsible AI deployment. They use the uh, this technology to optimize urban services while striving to limit its potential uh, negative impact. So these approaches ranging from mandatory to incentive based policy relied on various two different tools that can be regulatory, predictive, or operational. So these tools are guided by key principles such as innovation, transparency, participation, responsibility. Uh, private protection, ensuring an ethical and responsible use of AI. In, on, on the screen, you can see I just captured some of the resources and database where you can find uh, uh, different uh, uh, type of usage of AI in, in local government. So um, when we look at the first type of instrument, which are the planning tools, um, they play a crucial role in guiding AI governance uh, within municipalities. So their primary goals is to provide uh, a guiding framework by establishing fundamental principles while identifying some of the threats and opportunities associated with uh, AI um, use in, in the urban context. So these tools are essential for uh, planning the integration of AI in in a way that uh, uh, capitalize on this benefit while mitigating the, the potential risk. So the AI strategy for implemented by cities such as uh, New York, Vienna illustrated this approach, like as they provide a strategic reference framework for developing AI project to the needs of the municipality and also uh, the needs of the of the community. So this strategy ensure that AI is used ethically and responsibly, focusing on innovation, transparency, and other principles that I just mentioned. So we can also see some uh, kind of uh, regulatory tools like, uh, and they basically consist of the step of often binding measure designed to regulate um, the use of AI within municipality. Among this regulatory tool, uh, the uh, internal policy and guidances that articulate the guiding principle and ethical orientation of the municipality regarding AI usage. Uh, a notable example here is the is the Seattle Generative Artificial Intelligence Policy, which establishes kind of framework for um, the responsible use uh, of AI by municipality employees. You also have guidelines that provide um, practical recommendation and application measure for the AI usage within uh, urban services. And here you can you can you have, for example, the AI guideline developed by the city of San Jose, uh, illustrating this kind of um, uh, regulatory tool. So we then also have the what I call the operational tools, um, like the AI register we had, and they are essential for me uh, when we talk about transparency. So uh, this mechanism of government, uh, they ensure that um, they provide the kind of uh, standardized, accessible, and uh, archivable uh, framework allowing cities to document characteristic and impact of the AI system they use. For example, on the screen you have here the A the snapshot of the of the uh, Helsinki AI register and the San Jose AI register, but the difference here is like for Helsinki, it's basically the the 
the, the different AI that they develop themselves. Uh, and but the San Jose one also include like different kind of AI system that they get from their vendors, for example. So uh yeah, this is just the egg. And then what uh, we can also see is like cities also act as um, in networks to better govern AI. And this approach is quite interesting because it allows cities to optimize the achievement and share um, best practices um, to tackle similar challenges that they may face. So an example is the Gulf AI Coalition in USA. You have also the Oro City and the City Coalition for Digital I, I know um, uh, we can have many of them. So if you have uh, other one to share, do not, uh, do not hesitate. So, this body oversee the development and the implementation of AI policy. So, uh, so um, another thing here is like uh, AI governance also involve uh, internal or external bodies um, adapted to specific needs of cities ranging from technology and innovation department to advisory group. So uh, municipal governance of AI basically includes uh, a wide range of stakeholders, including academics, private sector, and civil society, and each bringing like basically kind of uh, essential perspective from the formulation of an implementation of AI strategy. So um, this kind of multi-stakeholder interaction basically ensure uh, uh, a holistic approach to, 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 to AI uh, governance. So, so um, in summary, like in the context of cities, AI governance encompasses like basically three aspects. So we have the usage of AI for the analysis, uh, understanding and provision of urban services. We have also the regulation part of AI to mitigate its potential negative impact. And then the last one, which is the various mechanism and measure taken by city to deploy AI responsibly. But, uh, for me, uh, the third aspect, this third aspect of AI governance is uh, very uh, is less addressed in the in the literature. So, um, another question uh, from you, I just wanted to know, um, based on, I mean, what has been discussed so far, like regulation, deployment, and mechanism for you. I mean, I just want to know what's your opinion. Like uh, for you, cities must put uh, more effort on what? Like, is it on regulation? Is it on deployment? Is it on boards? Is it on something else? So do not hesitate to uh, 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 to share your, your your opinion. So yeah, okay. I see most of the people think uh, boards. Yeah, I don't know. This is also a good answer. Even me, I'm not sure that uh, I know what they should do. So, um, or at least something else. But um, yeah. So thanks a lot. I, as we can see, most of uh, us think that, yeah, they should like, uh, oh, okay, regulation and both. Uh, okay, good, good. Then um, I think, um, I mean, when I discuss by my side uh, with um, with city officials, like people working with cities, like I realized that they they, they feel somewhat lost when it comes to AI um, uh, and unsure on the direction to take. So, but the challenge is also uh, then the challenge here becomes case to support these cities in holistic AI governance and. But you may wonder why it's important. So first, because I think it's necessary to articulate the different levels that we have discussed so far, the different levels and actual involved in AI governance. And secondary and most important in my point of view is like to ensure that AI governance is oriented towards uh, a common, uh, the common good. Um, and this involves understanding the dynamics uh, at play. So why AI indeed of uh, numerous opportunities it's crucial to not only fall uh, into absolute determinism so hence uh, it is important to uh, like question citizens through civil societies actors to incorporate their perspective into um, into this digital dynamic and um what's the problem and does it like basically just the questions like to know 
what's the problem? Like, uh, does AI really make any, or it will make any difference? But this, of course, will uh, depends on on how it is implemented through, throughout the uh, its life cycle. So, another significant consideration is the technical and financial capacity associated with uh, AI governance as a whole. So, not just the its deployment, but also its regulation and the structural transformation required from municipality because this needs um, quite a lot of uh, resources. So. Um, we in a we recently submitted a paper uh, where we attempt to explore some of these questions, particularly in the cities with limited resources. And our aim was to understand how secondary cities and those in the sub-Saharan Africa are approaching these um, challenges. So the objective of the of the paper is like to examine the influence of what we call the if uh, mutual level collaborative governance. So it's is a form of governance that involves different levels of actors in the collaborative processes on the responsible deployment of um, of AI in resources limited uh, urban area so um we wanted to like uh, to to i mean in the literature in the literature is like uh, AI governance mainly focus on regulation policies as we have seen and development strategy and this really less emphasizes on the actual mechanism of framework that can help like cities to to implement AI. And then also when you look at the what uh, what is discussed in on AI governance, like the literature on digital transformation as I mean when when you when you look at the global perspective and technological revolution they overlook settings such as small and major sized cities and cities in the global south in particular south of, um um, Sub-Saharan Africa. That's why we decided to to work on those case studies. And thanks to Sophie and Michael who were really helpful by providing some information for this uh, for this work. So um, the case studies that we worked on, um, we selected the Itikuini in South Africa and the regional municipality of Tigas de Blanville, uh, Quebec. So in Indiquini, what's basically the BIM tool, you probably know the, the BIM building and establishment automated map mapper, uh, that the, a tool uh, um, is the result of the collaboration between local municipality unit in, in South Africa, in Indiquini, in South Africa, and national connection, which is UNITAC and the community groups and proof mapping of uh, information. To me. And the second, uh, the second case is the Terrace de Blainville uh, in Quebec, uh, like the demo which demonstrate how AI can be leveraged to address uh, climate change challenge through coordinated effort involving various municipal, regional, and and private private sector actors. So, um, okay. So, I will just give like briefly uh, the, the 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 I I I hope I'm on time because. I'm seeing that it's almost an hour, so I don't know if I'm if I'm too long. So just let me know. You you are still on time. I think if we have like um ten more minutes for your presentation, and then we have enough time still to discuss. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. So let me just uh, be quick. Um, so so yeah, for the result of the paper, what we have seen is like, uh uh, uh I mean. This approach of mid level collaborative governance supports like these cities in the responsible development of AI. And it's not, it doesn't, uh, the approach doesn't uh, only address the technical financial uh, gaps this municipality face, but also ensure that uh, AI is used ethically and contextually and promote responsible urban innovation. So basically, these cities, I'm talking about cities with limited resources, like basically, rather than partnership collaboration involving a wide range of, of public and private actors, as well as international and community organizations that often extending beyond the national borders. So allowed the lack like long-term strategies or action plans similar to those with, uh, uh, with those of many large cities, this like the, launch, the launching like kind of experiment, experiment to harness AI. So it allows them to test the real potential of AI tool and then evaluate the need for more comprehensive long-term action, right? So, uh, 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 and they adopt an approach. They, this approach starts with um, identifying a specific problem 
and progress toward experimentation with uh, AI uh, uh, access solution. So for instance, uh, the municipality of Etiquini developed the BIM tool to accurately map informal and addressing the urgent needs to uh, real, um, reliable, uh, sorry for my accent, <laughs> reliable data um, in on, on, on uh, on to improve like uh, kind of uh, urban planning, so and then the the Terrasse de Blainville initiated AI pilot project to tackle climate change challenges like um, uh, mapping urban heat area like uh, flood and this kind of the thing, demonstrating that uh, an adoption of technological solution to uh, to the specific needs of the of the territory. So for me, I think this approach avoids the kind of pitfalls of technological solutionisms uh, characteristic of neoliberal smart cities where pre-existing tools are basically deployed in a territory without um, general consideration of the of need and the and the and the context. So um but uh, another thing also is like when when you look at this aspect of metro level collaborative governance air deployment is also probably impact uh, governance dynamics because municipality that are lacking expertise financial resources i mean they are compelled to like seek um, assistance uh, from ex uh, ex external actors to bridge these gaps and this can create a kind of dependency on this entity alighting like uh, the importance of strengthening uh, local knowledge and skills uh, to in basically empower those uh, those cities, and also involving like actors at um, different level rise a question of accountability, uh, the demarcation between um, AI deployer and a and the AI provider. For me, it's not clear due to the multiple of um, multitude of actor involved and the um, multi-phase world in 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 AI deployment. So, um, uh, what uh, we have been discussing so far, I mean, you can find them on this quite uh, complete online course um, on digital governance for inclusive and sustainable African cities. Uh, which um, we developed, uh, I think, one two years ago now. So uh, it offer a global um, perspective and overview of, of the um, governance landscape in the African context, and then how uh, specific technologies are employed by local government to tackle specific challenges in the cities. So it includes many case studies uh, from Morocco, um, Ghana, Kenya. Uh, South Africa as well. So, yeah. So, I mean, just to show you how, I mean, these specific cities approach like um, the use of uh, digital technology for urban transformation of their territory. So, the, the, the course is accessed for free online. So, do not hesitate to go and, and check. So, uh, I'm just showing this because we also engage in this discussion on the impact of uh, technology in cities. Um, we had uh, what we called insight into uh, the electrical chair, uh, where we invite different people to 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 share their their perspective on that. And uh, 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 what why we are doing that because we want to produce a kind of documentary where we will basically share, uh, confront the the view of um, experts and also city officials, because we also invite mayor and so on, and citizens, because basically when you go on the street and you ask the people, do you think that your city is smart? They will say, what? So basically we want to like get what they think, what, what, what for them smart city mean, and what what like what the, what is their view when we talk about for example, data and this kind of thing, are they aware of that? Uh, What's their perspective on that? And then to bridge the gap between uh, because most of the time, that's my personal feeling. We talk about this like uh, AI revolution, smart city, digital technologies, but basically, citizen on the street doesn't really care what he needs, like uh, a sidewalk, a park, and this kind of stuff. Okay, it's good because at we you can use technology to provide it, but for him, what's most important is not the money that we invest in this technology. It's the money that we invest actually in the concrete um, application like uh, in the cities. So that's why we, ha we are having this discussion and we produce this short documentary 
uh, hopefully soon before the before before the fall. So, and we also dis we have also uh, discussed some of the aspects through a workshop that we organized last year in Morocco with uh, some um, other researcher where we explore the impacts of uh, digital transformation in the African context. And the purpose of that was to make basically uh, a, a policy recommendation to, to, I mean, to local, to, to, to local officials in Africa. And, uh, and we were focusing more on four areas like digital rights, um, inclusion of vulnerable group. When we talk about vulnerable group, we talk about uh, elderly and then also people uh, we, uh, that are not able, for example, to speak languages such as French and English. I mean, this aspect of uh, inclusion in technology should be included, like languages. I saw the last update on Google Translate is good. They have included some local languages from Africa, uh, including uh, Swahili, Fong, and Benin, so on. That's good. And I think uh, uh, other technology can include this aspect of accessibility to to of, of local community to, the, to a specific technology. So we made this recommendation, and... Uh, we will also work on what we called, I don't know the name in, in, in English, but it's basically a plaidoyer, where a group of um, of um, of young planner in Africa, we basically make a um, uh, kind of recommendation to local government in the Francophone part of, uh, of the world to like address a uh, specific aspect related to sustainable and inclusive uh, development in uh, in cities. So, um, as uh, Sophie said earlier, I'm also part of a network called the uh, African Innovation Network, which basically publishes a series of magazines. So, um, the last issue was on urban mobility. So, we had uh, quite, I mean, the, the purpose of this magazine is basically to show concrete examples and impactful projects that are uh, currently implemented or has been implemented in specific city in Africa. So um, it's basically a collection of case studies and also taught from change makers, like through interviews and so on. So the last issue was on urban mobility. And then we are working on a new one uh, that will be released on 31st October as part of the World Cities Day, uh, which uh, focus on the potential of digital transformation in cities in Africa. And we will we are placed to 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 feature in this edition the case studies of uh, it queen in south africa and the mapping of informal settlement so we will have many other case studies like like these and then also interviews with uh, as i said uh change maker on the field so um so this is just to show that um i mean our perspective is like to show what works and to inspire others so it's not necessary. Um, how can I say that? It's like to show that, I mean, we we we, the way we see technology is not necessarily something as complicated. Even very small and very tangible, like low cost, low tech, all all those, uh, very impactful, like uh, technology can 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 change uh, a, a whole story. So the problem is not. The kind of the, the the how big the technology. I mean, big by 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 using big. I'm I'm telling I'm I'm referring to money or resources and this kind of stuff. It's not how big the technology is, but it's the impact that you have. And to have a specific impact is important. Very really important to understand what is the context. What's important for people that you are you you are working on. So that will basically be my message. I know. I mean, uh, maybe uh. I lose you with theories, long story around governance and so on. But <laughs> that's basically my key message. It's like really to understand because we sometimes behind a computer, but we interact with concrete people, people who need to breathe, drink water, sleep as us. So when we work, when we do, when we type all those lines of code, we should always have in mind that there are people behind it that will be impacted through what we are doing. So we should consider them like this kind of have have this kind of empathy when we we, we work and, and to be sure that what we are doing is relevant and will not uh, 
I mean, have a negative impact on, on people and, and community. So, yeah, so I come to the end. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, yeah, I leave you with this uh, very funny uh, images that I like. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Leandri. Um, I really like the last picture. I'm your father, no? Okay, <laughs> super sweet. Um, I don't know if you, can you see us? Or you, I, now you can see us again. Yeah, yeah, no? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so first of all, um, Leandri, thank you so much also for this interactive presentation um, and for, for, yeah, for involving us, even if we are not, um, not um, yeah, joining online and also for sharing some insights from your personal experience from Cameroon and the beginning of your talk and for taking us um, or drawing this broader picture and taking us to your journey on um, your holistic perspective on AI and governance. Um, I'm sure my colleagues also have some questions. I would just start with one question to kick off um, the discussion. Um, um, could you again summarize a little bit um, what's from your perspective important to consider for um, responsible or so-called people-centered use of AI? You mentioned um, AI as a common good or going through a common good, but I'm interested in, in what's, what, what are your key takeaways or um, um, main components must have in an AI and governance framework, for example, could you? Yeah, so, so yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I mean, I think the, 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 the most important question you have probably heard that is like to ask, what's the purpose? Like, is it like really, is it like, do we really need that AI, for example? I mean, as, as I said before, we are going so fast. I mean, you will wake up in the morning, you can take a nap and wake up and check your LinkedIn or social media, I don't know, or, or website and then see, oh, there's new advancement on AI that will basically, yeah, but that's good. But what's the purpose of that? What's really the purpose of that? Do we really need that? And um, for my point, it's like, I think that's the most important, like it should be the first question. Why do we do that? What's the impact? On, uh, on what we are doing because AI development for it's good. Like it helps uh, in different aspects, but it also comes with, um, for example, uh, impact on climate, for example. It's not just doing things to do, to just to do. It's like, take a time first to think, okay, what do people really need? Does AI is really the tool or the solution to that? If not, we don't we don't necessarily need to like spend the uh, time or money on that so the first question for me the first consideration to be responsible is like okay we have specific problem we have social problem what are those those problems what do people who face those challenging things what those people need and okay discuss with them and see is a solution is technological sometimes not technology is not always the solution so most of the time even just speak, talk with them, like hear them can be a way to the solution. That's why um, governance is important because governance is like, governance doesn't look at the, the, not just the tool, but mostly the process. So how you address a specific challenge is what are the mechanisms, the tool that you use? It could be AI, yes, but the most important is to hear from people here because no matter what we do, we live on the planet where people have like needs, concrete need. They need to breathe, they need to eat, those kind of basic elements. Uh, it is true with the modernity, there are many things else, but we should consider that first and then see if AI is the solution. Yes, okay, let's try. If it's not the solution and the solution is something else, just just uh, use, uh, maybe, I, I mean, it can be a USB key. For example, you can have a problem. For example, a municipality can have a problem to to uh, uh, I mean to manage their data. And you think that yeah, you develop a big AI platform that we collect, and then, but sometimes they just need the hardware. So okay, if the solution is the hardware, that's that's just give them a hardware. Don't just go and I mean build 
complicated platform that we not they will not be able to use in this kind of stuff. So for me, the I mean, talk with uh, people and just ask the first question: the why. Think about the frugality because as more we are frugal, as better it is. So and then uh, yeah, before we we go to complicated solution, just be, I mean, start from the bottom. That's uh, that's my. Okay, I'm. Thank you, Leandri. I'm just looking around. Are there? I don't see hands raised, but are there people who have questions or comments? Ah, Hilke, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Leandri, for this very nice uh, input. Uh, I feel you. I personally really hate giving those lectures in Zoom because you feel like you're talking into a black hole all the time. You feel very, very lonesome somehow. So I also appreciated like the the interactive parts. But we were all here just to to assure you. Um, and this being said, like this notion of the human factor that you addressed also, like with your answer in regards of the technology development, I mean, we all know that this is the way that it should be done. I mean, there should be more voices heard from diverse people. There should be much more diverse models. Um, there should be much more qualitative data involved and so on. And also the, the bias of data is a huge topic in regards of AI and governance. Do you, from your research, know like a like an example of a governance structure or city or whomever where you would say like, okay, those guys really did a good job over there because I feel a bit frustrated somehow because in theory, we all know that and we're preaching to the choir more or less all day long, right? I mean, you telling us the stuff that we're telling people and it's basically always along the same line, like pull people yeah. at the heart of, of, of those technologies. So I would be keen to learn if you know of an example from, from a city or a government somewhere uh, where you where you feel that they are on the, on the right track. Um. That's it's really complicated to answer to that question, but basically I don't know because if I knew I will just talk about them the whole presentation. But <laughs> but I mean some of them are trying because the, the the challenge from my perspective the challenge is the way is is how fast the way are going because imagine you are a local government you, you start something you start a solution. For example, you, you implement the AI tool or AI, or no, not the AI tool. You implement a solution. For example, I've seen many country, in many cities in Africa. For example, for finance management, they implement the software, but the time it takes for the for the workers, for the people who are working at the municipality to learn how to use that software. When it ends, it can take like for example one or two years. A new software it's all is already outside. And like the market is saying is the best one. You should do you, you should use that because because and all of those things. So how fast the the I mean the the speed of the of the technological development not always follow I mean the speed of human, the way uh, the time is take to learn to like uh, to really um grasp those 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 technology i don't have a specific example but what i can see is like kind of very few innovative approaches i remember this example of the mayor of Bekan in morocco is in the online course you can see it, where it basically transformed all the way all the public management of of, of a municipality going through online platforms collect data with citizens and it, there they even developed an indicator of inclusion of um, of um, of uh, of people with disability because in the city, for example, uh, there is no most of the mayor doesn't know how much disabled people are in the city. So without this data, it's very difficult to like plan city well. So what he did is like kind of also not mapping, but like gets all the information about uh, family living with. Um, people with a disability, which kind of disability. And from that, from that data, see where it's more uh, effect, where it will be more effective to, to, to make like specific uh, arrangement or specific, build specific infrastructure for those people. So I think this way of seeing things like, okay, I'm in a territory for whom 
am I working for whom? Am I uh, uh, want to build or design the specific infrastructure? And from that, see how I should do that. So for me, basically, that's a kind of, there are different uh, type way or type of back practices. Sometimes it's how the problem is um, understand or analyzed. Sometimes what, how the problem is addressed. So we should pick from diff all those different examples and to see how to build a, a good narrative. And it's always good to repeat. Yeah, it's, yeah, I know, I know sometimes it's a bit boring to like say the same thing every time, but I believe that through this repetition, maybe something will come out. And that's why also we, I mean, we start this magazine, the African Cities magazine, is to show this different example because most of the time people don't don't have information because they want to like, uh, they have a problem and they think that the solution will come very far away, but sometimes it's very close to them. So that's why we decided to build this kind of uh, a compendium, basically a compendium of best practice and then thought of uh, different people. But yeah, so that's basically my answer. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a bit sad that that I asked this question a lot and I never come <laughs> up with like someone who says, yes, there's like this bright example I can share with right. you. But I like that you put it into, it's about building narratives. Like, I guess we we need different kind of narratives about those kind of things. Thanks. Mm. Just looking around, are there further for the questions? Not Landry, I have a question on the African Cities magazine. Can you can you um, tell us a little bit how how you're working? Um, with whom are you working? Um, how is this network? How how you are working together? How are you collaborating? Um, have you funding for that, or how is this functioning? Um. So the the. I would probably start, I would probably, I mean, how it started is like, I, it was in 2018 when I noticed that there are many good things on going, the, especially in the African context, but it's really difficult to find a resource, I mean, somewhere or a publication or resources where you can find all those good examples. So that's why we decided to create this kind of network. So basically the network involves uh, architect, urban planner across different countries in Africa. We have a uh, members in Cameroon, Morocco, South Africa, um, Kenya, uh, Benin, Togo, and so on. So um, we basically, what we do is like, we basically share our views in terms of, uh, in terms of African cities. So projects, challenges, how it should be addressed and, and so on. So um, yeah, so we have, this publication, the magazine, the documentary that we are producing in Cameroon, in Cote d'Ivoire, basically it's like get voices from people on the field, how they see things, how they address uh, specific challenges and so on. And uh, in terms of funding, how we are funding is like, we are sometimes also do projects with uh, cities, uh, with um, uh, 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 organization. We, we have recently, last year, for example, we have done the um, um, uh, 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 in Bamenda in Cameroon. We done the climate change action plan for the municipality of Bamenda in Cameroon. So those kind of things that we are doing. And then, but what our purpose is not really to do project, but our purpose is to like to share new vision, build this kind of new paradigm and all uh, around African cities because. Most of the time, was than when I see how a city are planned because I'm do also photography. So, when you look at picture of African cities, for example, there's very a big gap. For example, you see the way infrastructure are built, like roads, sidewalk, and so on. It doesn't really fit the way we. I mean, in our culture, in our tradition, we use spaces. You see, for example, we use spaces for traditional event, this kind of stuff, but. You will never find in any cities those kind of infrastructure arrangement for this kind of specific events. So this is quite sad. So that's why we want to build a new narrative around African cities and then also change this kind of um, perspective from the north where I know in Africa there is cities is 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 a complete chaos. There are nothing <laughs> right there. So, but there are subtle 
uh, innovative things that it could be interesting to questions and to like uh, investigate. And that's why last year, for example, we want to start a, a kind of a research creation program around the model of African cities. So basically what we will do, we will look at um, the aspect of technology, the aspect of culture and tradition, the aspect of vernacular architecture, and the aspect of uh, mobility, just to see on a small plot what could be the, the a, a, not a model, but what could be a good example and an Afrocentric perspective of African cities, not just in terms of architecture, but in terms of the way we use space. I remember when I was young, for example, when, uh, I mean, you have a mother and she doesn't have time to look at you, she can leave you, uh, I mean, uh, at someone's place before going to market, for example. And this is kind of trust. Another example is where we cook a good meal at our home. My mom used to like take a small part and give it to me and say, okay, go and give it to my friends who are living, for example, to one or two kilometers away just to let her know that I have cooked something good and I should share it with her. So most of the time it was those kind of very, very subtle a way we do things that could be translated in, in the way we, we we arrange or we manage uh, uh, our our urban area. So that basically the, the 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 vision or the purpose behind the African Innovation Network is true that so far most of the thing that we have done is basically those magazine documentary and so on. But we want to go through a, a I don't want to use the, the work model but through the vision like a very a tangible vision that uh, of, of of this uh, African city. So that that's basically what we, we we are trying to do, and of course see how technology can be embedded in that if it's necessary, because uh, also seeing the African context, um, sometimes when I talk with my friend or my colleague, I'm joking like if something happened to the technological evolution, for example, a solar eruption and these kind of things, we will not have any problem in Africa, for example, because it's true that we don't use that much technology, but it makes us a kind of, it builds us a kind of resilience because we can survive without that. For example, when we see, for example, that's what happened during the COVID, for example. It was very easier for us because we are used to, like we have this kind of internal uh, uh, resilience to shocks. But when something happens, it can be bad. I don't, I'm not saying that it's good, but we have this kind of, um, we have something I don't know what, and that's why I want to understand also, like we have this kind of something, this kind of habit, this kind of small thing that we are doing when we face an issue that could be very interesting to translate uh, in the way we, we plan uh, cities to avoid those challenges that we are seeing in terms of waste management and so on. So yeah, that's basically the idea, the, the idea uh, behind it. Yeah, thank you, Lirandri. I think this is a very, very great initiative that you have because you, you're you providing a platform not only for research, you provide a platform for research, but also for, as you mentioned, project articles from the field. No? So there's a, mm -hmm. there's a huge variety in, in, in this magazine and also in the work that you're doing with the initiative. Um, yeah, looking at the time and looking if there are hands uh, raised, uh, no hands raised, then I have a final question for you. Um, I'm just super curious um, how your research is going to continue. What are you going to, because you just um, started a year ago, your PhD, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah exactly. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So um, what are you going to focus on next? And have you any concrete use cases or what? how is your research going to continue? If you know. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the precision is really important because, you know, the, the beginning of PhD is, is always a struggle. But um, they, 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 I mean, what I see so far, I mean, I want looking at that aspect of governance not to be too much theoretical. It's like to look at the three scales, like the international, the national and the local level. So how it could be translated to address like specific people needs. So I want to see I mean, from the national level, what are the arrangements um, uh, uh, that government put in place and that can be help cities? For example, 
uh, in the article, the last article, the second case studies of Terrace de Blainville, what was interesting is like the aspect of leadership of the official because there's no funding available to fight to fund AI projects in, in Canada or in Quebec, for example. But the good thing is like he used another opportunity from the from the from the government called the Fonds Ruralité a region, I don't know how to say in English, but it's like basically a fund used for something else. And he has been able to convince the other official to say, okay, let's try AI on this specific project. So I want to see how this specific arrangement can support cities in their, their AI, AI governance. But what I will focus more on is the, is the perspective for civil society. It's like, okay, you have this uh, kind of, all those organizations in the cities, what do they think? What do they really need? And what could be the uh, the opportunity offered uh, by um, by AI to address those specific challenges? So I want to question them and to see, for example, do they really think that through AI we can address some specific solution? And if then, how? So it's kind of, uh, uh, at the end, it's like to see I mean, the, the, the global map, what the government do, what the cities are trying to do, and what are the actual needs of those who are concerned in, in, in this area. So basically, that's why, that's how my research is framed so far. And for the, I will take a, a case studies approach, but I'm not quite sure where I will, where I will start, because the thing also is to see in need to be behind curve, curve uh, uh, an existing background theme of AI deployment in, in a specific city. But basically, the point is like to see it's more like a coll collaborative and co-creation process involving um, civil society to see, okay, uh, are they interested to AI? What the thing that should be done through AI? What are the specific needs? And then how to translate it into policy or action at the city level or at the national level. So basically, that's why I will try to do for my research. Okay, thanks, Leandri. Um, looking forward to um, get to know more from your research. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for the invitation, yeah. Yeah, thank you also from, from my side, Leandri. Um, and you are, as I already mentioned at the at the start, uh, the last person in our um, digital urban culture lecture series that we started, uh, I think three or four months ago, um, which is on the one hand sent, but said, but on the other, uh, it's it's very nice because uh, we will go on with this format because everyone really liked it. Uh, as was the case of today, I'm really, really sure. So thank you again for this lecture, but also thank you colleagues, all of you who took the time to suggest someone and invite someone and be a critical friend and moderate this session. It's really a pleasure to work in such a great team with so many inspiring and amazing colleagues. And I'm really, really looking for the next round of this lecture series. And uh, yeah, I feel very, very privileged to have you all as colleagues uh, on my side. Have a very nice afternoon and uh, thank you, Leandri. Many greetings to Montreal. Enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, thank you so much, and bye bye, everyone. <laughs>